We went some pretty gnarly places. It was like, oh, how are we gonna make that? Oh shit, that's the throne. I was so excited at the idea. Feels like it's gonna hit you in areas I don't think you wanna be hitting. You are all inspired by it, and it is kind of like, oh my god, this is serious. This was obviously the first action set piece, and to me, it was a little bit like approaching Battle of the Bastards. It's something that I really wanted to try and achieve something a bit special. And action. I'd never seen anything like it. Stuntmen with jousts going at each other at what feels like a million miles an hour. The first joust, which is what we call a jerk back. So what we did was we took the drum off of what's called a descendo, and it's what we use for people jumping off buildings on a wire. So we hashed it about so that we could actually look in profile at the guys going together like that. And when they hit together and broke the lance, we could hit the brake and it would jerk the guy off the back of the horse. Jousting is risky against another guy in full armor in a galloping horse. I think you just have to give it a go. We used over 30 horses. We worked extremely closely with Rowley, because the tournament is when our two departments really kind of come side by side. Rowley loves horses. That's a big thing for all of us, as to how to keep it interesting and feel dangerous, but at the same time be incredibly safe for the horses. We had our hero horses. Stunts don't ride them. They're purely for the actors. And then we'll have three repeats for the stuntmen. So the horses will do five runs, and they get a rest, and then the next horse comes on, since so all on stuntmen, because there's only one of them. They had me ride for about 50 hours at the Devil's Horseman, which is this old institution that have been teaching actors to horse ride for years. Sir Kristen Cole will now tilt against Sir Damon Targaryen, Prince of the City! Sir Damon fights Cole. It's scripted they have two passes. What are we going to do that gets Damon off his horse and embarrasses him? So then I was like thinking, well, okay, what if he fell onto the tilt rail? Because I've not seen that before. And what we did is ran a cable cam down the middle of the tilt rail and we got it really up close and personal, so you feel really close to the action. And watching the guys do that, with everyone cheering, the horses rearing, it literally gave me chills. It was so cool. Action! We know Damon's a great fighter, but we need to know that Cole's a better fighter. He used the flail, which is a real art to using it. The Morning Star is incredibly difficult to fight with. It tends to have a life of its own. It constantly feels like at some point it's going to hit you in areas I don't think you want to be hitting. My main aim was to just learn to use it well enough so that I wouldn't lose important parts of me. <laughs> Let him get to the thing. Uh, I'm really telegraph when it's coming, because yeah. then he can go, oh, yeah, yeah. Of the last yeah, yeah, yeah. Matt and Fabian did a great job on that particular fight. I think a lot of it was to do with they knew that they had to prove themselves, and it was the first Game of Thrones fight we were doing on the show, and they were like, you know, we better not fuck this up. Sweet. Got it. Well done. Yes, um, go home, rest. Thank you. Good boys. Thank you all. The tournament's really one of those places where you get to see everybody you hired on your crew earning their paycheck because it requires all departments to work together. Visual effects, the art department, production design, props, horse wrangling, stunts, all those things coming together and trying to make a richly realized sequence. It's really incredible and really orients you into the world in a way that I think is very memorable. Oh! Well done, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done, everyone. The Targaryens are a very powerful dynasty. So it's all about show. It's all about, look how powerful I am. Look what castle I've got. Look what artifacts I've got. That's the driving force in all of the designs, I think. Over a weekend, Jim pretty much just cracked out a design for the whole Red Keep, and on the Monday morning, we're looking at this thing thinking, blimey, how? 
I remember going there for the first time and walking in and my jaw dropping to the floor and just thinking, oh, I said big. I don't know if I meant that big. That red keep set absolutely blows my mind. I was telling our mentees, go really walk that set and fully appreciate it because it, it, you really won't see anything that big, that spectacular, except for a few times in your career. Jim Clay and his team built a really completely realized world, almost 360 degrees. So really, until you looked directly up and saw the, you know, saw the rack lighting, uh, you couldn't tell that you weren't walking around an actual medieval castle. They really went to town and made it a universe. And I think one of the principles behind Thrones has always been, particularly with sets, is I need to be able to shoot in every direction without it becoming a visual effect. And you can certainly do that on the Red Keep. There was me designing this enormous set, which was going to take months and months to work, and we had a schedule, and there was a point where the guy said to me, this isn't going to be possible. Our most challenging element with regard to set really was the time. We had 16 weeks to build this, which by anybody's stretch is some going really. So as a team, we got together. Miguel and Ryan were hugely supportive. They wanted to keep that set and realize it as we designed it. And so they shifted the schedule around endlessly and we achieved it that way. But you know, God bless the guys because they stood behind it and we, we got it built as we conceived. It was a remarkable achievement from the construction department and you know, props as well and set deck to pull that enormous sprawling set together. It's roughly about 62 metres long, it's 39 metres wide, and at its highest point, it's about 13 and a half metres. We used 3,692 sheets of eight before three quarter ply. We used 52,038 metres of three by one timber, and we used 49,248 metres of four by two timber. And we also used gallons of blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> The stage is a composite set, which means rather than build individual rooms for individual scenes, this is a set where all the rooms are combined into one massive space, so it's the interior of the castle. I think the thing that threw me is that it's all to scale. You know, like it's like you actually walk up in there and then you can go into my room, you can go into the small council chamber, you can go into um, Paddy's room. It's all like built in, it's not on separate stages, which was really fun to play with and it made the world like a lot more immersive. It's like a little town they've built essentially. And it's weird because you walk through it and you keep finding different elements to it that you've never filmed on. Brother? Damon. It's cool, it's cool. This, you know, I sort of like being on there. The composite also allows lots of positions to watch, to observe to understand the little pockets of conversations that are going on, to add to the, the intrigue and the conspiracy that must go on all the time in those places. Well, I went home to my wife and I said, uh, we could live there, move in there. <laughs> it feels like I do live there. My father is a king. It is incredible. I mean, it's a castle in a stage. I've never been on a set like the Red Keep. As Damon was coming up the beach in Cornwall, we now see that beach from episode two now fully covered in bodies. The whole battle itself was originally set to take place on that beach, and I scouted it and was like, there's no way. We literally would have been able to shoot for about three or four hours, and there just wasn't the time to get through the workload, even if the weather was kind. Because of all our tidal issues in Cornwall and on, on the beaches in general, the idea was to recreate a beach in a controllable environment so we could shoot continuously and get the same environments every day. The joke on set became it was the battle of the back lot. The challenge is with moving it to the studio is suddenly everything feels fake. You know that it's going to be a real team effort to make all that work together. So to create the soldiers and sailors, we would all get together prosthetics, hair, costume, and makeup. Once we'd created them, it took weeks to age them and break them down. 
There's a lot of seaweed and things like that going in. We've been burning timbers left, right and centre to do a kind of post-burn dragon attack look. I'm going to stick it in Theo's neck. I'm glad there's a camera. Pineapple juice is my safe word. At the beginning of production, it's always important to find out what your big setup is. And for us, it was the Stepstones battle. 165 aside, Valerians and West Dorossi soldiers on one, and then we've got the Triarchy Taroshi pirates on the other. Ryan was keen to have the Valerians come across as rich. And it's not just those sort of single characters. We have all the armies to deal with as well, and, and all the shields to paint. We had about six bodies. We also had extras who were covered in prosthetics. Huge slashes, stakes through the hands and through the wrists. The head and torso section of the crab feed was quite an extensive build for us. Oh, wow. so nasty. Sculpted the cross section of the torso with a, an articulated armature, so when uh, Matt drags him along, everything kind of moves correctly. Uh, yeah, that was really heavy, actually. It kept getting waterlogged. It's like the weight of half a human. Bless his heart. <laughs> There was this moment for Damon when he thought, the game's up, this is it. We looked at Black Hawk Down and the scene in the ruined helicopter and the soldier in there knowing that he was going to die. And so we came up with the boat wreck and the skeletal frame of a boat washed up on the beach. It's really incredible what they were able to do. But then also they had these amazing painted 2D backings that they put onto the containers that surrounded the set. Scenic art in our industry is often referred to as a dying art. I honestly don't think it is at all. People were in awe of how believable it was. Essentially an old Wiley e. Coyote gag, and it worked. That's a silent era filmmaking technique that he used, and it was mind blowing. more of their Blackwater pleasure yacht sailing vessel. It's not something that they would probably take out in the open sea, but they spend a lot of time sailing the Blackwater because they go to Driftmark and Dragonstone, the two popular houses, so they need this fast ship that can kind of go back and forth between. But it was exciting, you know, to, to build that. I think there is a lot of naval presence in this, uh, in this series, but it was a you know, neat set to build, and, and it's one of those things where you, you hear they're building a ship on the back lot, and then you actually go and see it, and oh, they actually built a ship on the back lot. The flagship was a lot of fun. I think Claire had a lot of fun shooting that. It's the weirdest thing to be involved in designing all these different sets. This was a lovely opportunity because on Game of Thrones, we were always using kind of like the same ship for, for various different things through a lot of the seasons. So this was a chance to sort of come up with a different ship design. It needed to look quite grand and royal, but it's not like a massive ship. It's just something they use for touring. So only the bit that people had to actually stand on was built. Everything else is going to be us. So it's it's uh, probably only a third of, of the actual size of the real ship. The set was beautiful. VFX was really prepared for the extensions or, you know, what kind of shots do we want to do and how, what was the best way to achieve them. Ready and action. We shot on the Targaryen flagship. We storyboarded it to quite a high degree. We sort of worked out every single shot, what that would be. And then we pretty much built 360 degree blue screen around it. We worked out that we wanted to give a slight movement with the camera. We found a, just the right sort of degree so to get the sense of the boat moving and wind. And we had this incredible special effects of this water just being thrown over the side. So, you know, it's just a feat of coordination more than anything. So one of the dragons swoops the boat and tilts it over so everyone on the, the ship had to do a bit of a Star Trek back and forward. <laughs> I think you need to search for moments of levity and making a show that's as grim and heavy at times as, as this is. But the trick with that is that they have to be in tone with the show. So it's finding, it's finding a moment of levity in the darkness. All 
these wonderful objects are an incredible tribute to the sea snake's life. It is a vanity because, of course, it's like, yeah, I did that and I did that and I did that. And what did you do? Oh, you were born into royalty. Well, I made my stuff. And so there are all these wonderful objects and mementos from his, his voyages, these legendary nine voyages. We really just gave Claire and Jim what we know about the sea snake, and we really turned them loose. I mean, the collaboration with the set decorator on every movie is absolutely key. And with Claire, it is very much a harmonious collaboration. We literally went back to the history of Coralus and his story, which then helped us with the different artifacts that we made for that set. He would take a treasure from each place, and that's what kind of became a big part of his set. We talked a lot about that and what they should be, and we'd looked at various art exhibitions and pieces in the British Museum, and then she went off and designed her own pieces to represent his life. Before we started shooting in there, I had asked Ryan for some information about the voyages, or at least about the memento, so that when I, as the sea snake, looked at those things, I had a memory. It was not going to be in the script, it was just something for me. We really pointed a lot at Hearst Castle and, you know, what William Randolph Hearst built with his family's wealth and then filled it with the treasures and artifacts he was able to acquire. The Sea Snake did the same thing, but these were artifacts that he essentially won or purchased on his own travels, being the Sinbad of this time. I just want the camera to go through every single thing that is in that set. The detail is unbelievable. It's so beautiful. It's amazing, and the Hall of Nine, we did some fantastic pieces for that. I think we're very lucky. I mean, we, we've got some very talented people in the workshop. The concept's coming, and you look at some of them, and you think, how the hell we're we gonna do that? And, you know, between the guys in there, we work out a formula. I mean, all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff, which we've never done before, so they're all very unique. It was amazing, Brief. Everything was creative. Everything has to be made from scratch. You know, stuff we've never made before. Everything was influenced by things already made around the world, and we basically tried to copy what they wanted and make it better. The Hanging City has been made really lightweight, but had to be made so it looked like bone and ivory. So we had to think of a method that we could do that was easy to be hung up really lightly. That took a lot of thinking of how we're gonna make it. We ended up using loft insulation boards. We used those different thicknesses to carve and we basically layered it all together to create the structure. It was lightweight but strong as well. You never quite know how they're going to turn out when you start them. And a lot of the times, you know, trial and error to get where we are with it. But when you see it then you can stand but that's the, the rewards. I like the snake orrery. There was two snakes intertwined and you see the globe in the middle. By the time it's all painted, you wouldn't know it was just polystyrene or insulation foam underneath it. I constantly get amazed at what we can do, and I think, did we make that? Are you sure we made that? Are we that clever to make that? But we did. The Driftwood Throne was really interesting because that was the sea snake's ancestral seat. We wanted to build it and do its service because the sea snake is a proud guy, and Jim and Claire went out and actually built a throne out of driftwood. It's an incredible piece of work. And really the only person whose feet touched the ground when they sat on it was Steve Toussaint, the sea snake himself. The Hall of Nine, it was lovely to see it as it developed over the weeks as they were building it. And then you actually walk on there and it's all dressed, ready for filming. That's when you sort of realize, yeah, Game of Thrones is back. We're, we're doing it again. Episode six was one of the big leaps for us because you're not only jumping forward 10 years in time, but you're recasting, <laughs> you're recasting the show midway through. We always spoke of it as our second pilot. You come in on Rhaenyra giving birth and then the slow reveal being that this is her third and that much time has passed. There's a 10 year time jump. You see her now husband, Laner, Harwin Strong. He's the actual father of all of these children. Viserys is slowly deteriorating, and Alison, meanwhile, is strong and in her prime and sort of running things. There's a lot of ground to cover. Making a determined time jump and then changing the main cast was just a brilliant way to do it. We talked a lot about who should shift into being older versions of themselves, and we felt that Rhaenyra, Alison, Lena, and Lainor they were important. They were all interacting with each other heavily and, and they had experienced that passage of time together and it was a good way of grounding the time jump. 
the Queen has requested that the child be brought to her immediately. Why? I remember the phrase that Ryan said about Rhaenyra, which is she needs to be punk rock, non-conventional. You're looking at the Targaryen line, you're looking at the Amelia Clark Association further down the line. You know, you're looking at the woman who set everything in motion. And that has to be a force of nature. Somebody with intelligence and feels otherworldly. And that's Emma. Emma does not fit into a slot that is easy. Emma is such a striking, unique presence. When I first saw them in the audition, it was like I couldn't imagine the role being played by anybody else. With Alicent and Rhaenyra, we were focusing on the adult versions first. I had to keep reminding everybody the people that were going to be leading the charge were going to be their younger versions. Millie Alcock, she read and it was just a gift from the gods. We were very lucky. She is a remarkable version for younger Emma. I see them in the costume and I'm like, is that what I'm gonna? I look great. Rhaenyra, you should be resting after your labors. Olivia is probably the most seasoned actress of them. We wanted her in the show. She did such a strong audition. We got Olivia to read for Rhaenyra as well, and she did astonishing reads for both of them. It became clearer that she would be better suited to Alicent. And certainly once we'd met Emily, the pair of them were wonderful. Olivia, I've been in awe of her work for years, and so to play the younger version of her is a blessing. That Miguel and Ryan had said, Alicent is probably the character that changes the most in that time jump. There are multiple things that we both portrayed through Alison that connects the two characters together, but where my Alison leaves and where hers begins, they are almost completely different people. If Rhaenyra comes into power, your very life could be forfeit. I do feel like we lucked out with our Alicents and our Rhaenyras. I think for me it's always about the energy Millie and Emily reflected the energy of Emma and Olivia. The show is very demanding just in terms of the sheer number of actors, but also the quality of the performer because they're deeply nuanced roles. Kate brought forward an amazing pool. It took a lot of doing, but we were able to put together a hell of a cast. Oh boy, I just heard. Yes. Well done. In order to play Leonor as we find him in episode six, I really had to know exactly who he was before the time jump. But I was cast first and started filming. I looked up and I saw this person walk in. And I looked at him and then he looked at me. You seen each other across the room? I, was... I said, are you me? And he went, yes. <laughs> I had some talks with Miguel and he gave me a few treats about the character that he would say to the other girls as well, I think. There are similar things that I'm guessing they'll say to all of us about our characters. I haven't met them. So it's going to be exciting to see who they are and how they interpret the character. I've never done the part where I've shared with an actor before. I asked to meet them and Miguel was like, yeah, 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 and never set it up. So I was like, I think this is a strategic move um, on their part. It is a complicated thing because even when you're not kind of watching that work, you are building something together. When I'm queen, I will create a new order. The crown of the conqueror passed down through generations. Aegon's crown is a 3D printed item. 3D printing is quite interesting because it's resin that's then copper plated and then nickel plated and then iron pasted to get this look. It's quite an in-depth experience to get to this point and leather on the inside to make it a little bit more comfortable. And it definitely doesn't fit me. I wish it did. Aegon Targaryen is the true heir to the Iron Throne. This is the coronation scroll holder, which the Septon will open when they crown Aegon. The item goes back and forth between us and graphics for sizes, looks. I quite like how things bounce around all the time and how many people end up being involved to get this thing done. I'm very interested in the design and construction of movie props and swords in particular. And there are three Valyrian steel blades in this particular story. The first of those is Dark Sister, and that ends up in Damon's hand when he's given it for his prowess on the tournament field as a knight and a dragon rider. 
The second sword is Blackfire that all the Targaryen kings have carried and wielded, you know, Jaehaerys and Viserys and, of course, Aegon himself. So I hunted down Peter Janssen, knowing that he was a real sword designer, and said, hey, can you create something that is a real weapon that looks like it's from this fantasy world that we're creating? When you make a sword, the first priority is to make it purposeful and well-balanced. But a sword is also an object of power, and it has to express this power in its design. And to show that these Targaryens took on the faith of the seven gods, everything is built from this circle with a seven-pointed star. So everything is held together by this geometry. as a mystical way to bind the power of those seven gods and the symbol of the dragon into these objects. When we make a weapon, we always make it for real for the filming. And then we will produce rubber versions from that. And we might make hard versions, we might make soft versions, depending on what the stunt requirements are. Peter had used Damascus steel to make the Blackfire sword. So step by step, we engineered the blade and then transfer that into vector files. Then to print that out, lay the vinyls on, peel the sections off, you then lay it into the acid to let it eat away at the open metal. So much effort's gone into the blade at this point, and it can just go wrong by putting it all in acid. Luckily, we've got some really fantastic blades. The old one that people should recognize is the famous cat's paw dagger that we first met in season one of the original Game of Thrones, the dagger that is put into cat's paw hand to go murder Bran Stark after his fall off the roof and after witnessing Jaime Lannister and Cersei Lannister together. And we actually got the original cat's paw dagger flown over. We looked at it, measured it, and we decided to reduce it slightly. And, but it's got the same silhouette, but it has a different feel in the way it's been manufactured. And the thought was, you know, between now and then, it may have been rehilted, but at the end of the day, it's got the dragon bone hilt and the, and the same Valerian steel blade. And we just really like this idea that the dagger that ends up passing through hand after hand after hand was a nice way to tie the two series together. It doesn't matter. What do you mean, it doesn't matter? I don't want it. I think... That's become our House of Dragons backlot, so we can stay there and develop over the years. They're building more stages uh, next season. It's new, it's contemporary, it has all the facilities, so it's, it's a joy to work on a space like this. I can watch behind the scenes stuff on, on all the shows and go, wow, that's amazing, you know. It's been great working amongst sets with real things and cutlery and, and, you know, the world around you. It's been a joy. The most rewarding moments working on this show is really with the actors. I really enjoyed delving into the characters, working on the scenes. It was a true collaboration. And by the end of it, we were just working very instinctively together. What I've liked most is actually getting to know all these people. Relationships that I've had with the cast has been extraordinary. People who are now my mates. And I think what, again, what Miguel and Ryan have done and all of the directors that we've had, I don't think there's one person that I've come across who I've thought, ooh, he or she's a bit dodgy. I don't know, that's an incredible thing to create an atmosphere like that, that's extraordinary. It's been really nice to be all together like a family. Just being able to do this job to achieve what I certainly would have 20 years ago called my dream job uh, is an, another thing entirely, so it's, it's, it's really amazing.